a little bit of a stop, <laughs> drop, crash, crash my, my car, car better call, call top. top. Hey, man, <laughs> let's go. That was so catchy. Yeah, bro, it's running on the radio right now. That's so sick. Rough Riders anthem, top dog style. Yeah, he's a master class in marketing as well. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't know this man, you probably don't have Instagram. Favorite rappers, favorite influencer. All the content creators know you. You work with a lot of them. We got DJs that know you. You're pretty much the man in the city of Philadelphia. This is like my hug video right here. Yeah, this is it right here. <laughs> we got Top Dog's dog right here, Dollar. Might make an appearance on this podcast. <laughs> Might cut off the camera real quick. I know, right? But for those that don't know Top Dog, fill people in. Where are you at right now? Business and life. I'll start. We're sitting in this beautiful home, new home in, in Arizona, I man. appreciate that. Appreciate brother. you having us. Yeah, of course. So my name's James. I also go by Top Dog, Top Dog Law on every platform. I am a lawyer by trade, but I've really kind of become a content creator. I think I was one of the first lawyers to start doing regular content on Instagram, like 2018, 2019. Basically built that social media following and then was able to kind of build a brand off of the back of that. So basically built the brand out. Now have built a business on the back of it. Kind of started off as a uh, traditional law firm mm -hmm. and have moved into being a lead generator all across the country. Had a lot of fun building out the brand and uh, I feel like we're just getting started. So absolutely. So take us back, man. You have an incredible story, story of overcoming a lot of things. I'll let you decide where to start, but we, we want to hear that story. Cool. So I was probably 17 when I first got into Percocets. I tore both my shoulders wrestling. And uh, between 17 and 25, I had a really, really tough time with that. You know, I, I was a kid who was like a level one student in high school. I was a president of my class. You know, I had a lot of things going for me, but I also loved how the drugs and the drinking and the party lifestyle kind of gave me this edge. You know, I, I think I did it a lot to like be cool, fit in, which is I think as a child, right, is something like as an insecure kid, that's what I always wanted. And, uh, you know, it took me down a pl place where after I had graduated from Penn State. I was in a fraternity there, and I managed to get into the law school by the skin of my teeth. I was, like, the last person admitted. I still remember my dad, like, walking around my house being like, you better not fail out. And, uh, oh, wow. It's a lot of pressure. A lot on. of pressure. And I always wanted my dad to be proud of me. I really tried in law school that first year, and I got great grades. But when the second year hit and I kind of got comfortable, I got back into, like, the drug-seeking behavior that had gotten me in so much trouble before and this time it was worse than ever and uh, in 2016 it finally culminated with me going to drug rehab ironically it was five minutes down the street from where I grew up right mm. so like imagine the feeling of being like in a drug rehab five minutes from your parents house and being like what the hell happened to me like, how did I get here? I don't belong here. And crazy story, Jesse. So there was a guy in the bed next to me in the rehab, and he was working for the same judge in, like, the mid-1980s that I was working for that summer in New Jersey. Judge Samandel, since deceased, RIP. And uh, he had worked for Judge Samandel in the 80s. And now here he was, obese, in this rehab bed, screaming about, like, suicide. And it was like God was just telling me, like, if you don't, change your ways now like this is you down the road I have been sober seven years and uh, I think it's important to say like that was in 2016 from 2016 to 2018 I, there was no top dog law like I didn't go right into building this business and and all that I spent two years really after drug rehab just focusing on me going to like sobriety related meetings trying to understand like what happened and to try to build a new foundation, you know, self-confidence comes from keeping the promises you make to yourself. And if you're someone in addiction, you tell yourself day after day that you're not going to do something only to violate your own word. And so you lose a lot of confidence in yourself. And so for those two years, you know, waking up when I said I was going to wake up, working out when I said I was going to work out, eating clean when I said I was going to eat clean, doing my assignments when I said I was going to do the assignments, right? Like I started to build that trust in myself again, which mm -hmm. I think was the foundation for what I ended up being able to do in business. But yeah, it wasn't an easy ride. I can't imagine, man, because I mean, the success rate of someone going to rehab, I'm assuming is probably pretty low. Yeah, that was one of the things that I felt very grateful because, you know, I was still in law school at the time. You know, I did a JD MBA program. So I actually did a law degree and an MBA. And 
I had done a lot of things that really could have ruined my life, like felony charges or, you know, some other situation where you really have a lot harder of a time coming back. And mm. one of the things that I had in the back of my head was like, dude, if you can just like get this problem under control right now, your whole future is ahead of you. And I actually have a lot of admiration for guys that, you know, have ruined their marriages. Their kids don't talk to them. They have three felonies and they're still having to like dig deep in that place to change themselves, right? Yeah. For me, I felt blessed because it was like, I knew if I could do this now, I could still like write my own story to the book. And that was part of what motivated me though to take it seriously and to stay with it was because I knew that I might not have another chance. This might be my one window to really mm -hmm. like step into the person I wanted to be, but I had to seize it then. Yeah. So you yeah. started stepping into the person by keeping those promises to yourself every morning, getting up, working out, like you said. When did Top Dog Law start? Why do you even want to get into law in the first place? So after rehab, I didn't have much of a social life, right? I, I still remember, actually, I had two of my good buddies who I'd lived with got this, like, crazy apartment in Center City, Philly, and they had this Halloween party, like, two weeks after I'm out of drug rehab, and, like, every group of girls we knew was going, and, like, that was my scene prior to ending up in rehab, right? Mm -hmm. And I made that decision that night to stay home. And I've made a lot of decisions mm. since then to stay home. And because I didn't have that social life, when someone came up to me in my apartment complex and said, Hey, I was starting this marketing company selling advertising to lawyers. I thought, well, I got a lot of time on my hands. Like, like I'm not really doing much else. So like, yeah. sure. Why don't I help you? I'll try to make some side money. And I did, I ended up making like up to eight grand a month in recurring sales commissions mm -hmm. by selling lawyers on pay-per-click and SEO advertising. But the biggest benefit I got wasn't the income. It was that I got to meet personal injury lawyers all across the country and learn what do they do? I got to see these guys had like mm. planes in some cases. Like I got to understand that they weren't really lawyers. They were businessmen that were running law firms. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, I want to do that. And so I ended up starting my own personal injury law firm in Philly. Um, this is prior to the COVID pandemic. So it was in office. You know, I took every dollar I had, $187,000. I started my own personal injury law firm. And, you know, I worked like heck and there were some struggles. I mean, the hardest part is, you know, in personal injury, when you get a new client, you don't get paid when you sign up that client. That client mm -hmm. doesn't pay you. You only get paid two years later when the case settles. So for the first two years of your business, you have basically no income. How were you able to survive during those first two years? It was Especially that, you literally said I went all in. You yeah. spent every dollar into that. I spent every dollar. And so it was like, well, I had rationed out the money that I got. I had a hundred thousand in sales commissions. I had a, a line of credit in my personal bank, which I think was 11,000. I managed to get 35,000 from this like small bank called Key Bank, where like, I'm pretty sure she fudged the numbers. On, like, <laughs> shout out Key Bank. Shout out Key Bank. <laughs> and then I had like this loan shark guy who charged me 15, 16, 17% interest, but it was like, I needed all the money I could get my hands on. And that business would have worked. I think what I realized though, about two years into that business was that I was better at bringing in the clients than mm. I was actually doing the operational heavy lifting. And there was this other lawyer in Philly who came up to me and he was like, Hey, you're 28 years old at this point. He's like, you're bringing in 40 new clients a month. He's like, that's like top 10 for the lawyers in Philly. He's like, but you're not really experienced actually doing the litigation work on these cases. He's like, how about we partner up together? Mm. And I was resistant to that idea at yeah. first because my original dream was like, hey, I want to build up this law firm and do it all internally. But then I realized I'm like, oh man, if I can partner with him and I can focus my efforts on bringing in clients and building out my social media platform and later getting into billboards, radio, all the other advertising we do, right? Spending millions and millions of dollars. It's like I can become in the top 1% a business origination in the legal category. Hmm. And the only way I get to that top 1% is if I'm not doing all the other stuff related to the operational work of the litigation. And Got so it. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this one thing that I seem to be good at, right? Play to your strengths. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've been able to scale that from 40 cases a month to, you know, 
thousand. It's amazing. Yeah. A couple of things I want to touch on. One, you just started getting going at like twenty six because it sounds like by twenty eight you started having buzz. People reached out to you in Philly. You were starting to become known. But you started at twenty six. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people right now are like, if I don't become a millionaire by twenty, man, my <laughs> life is over. Do you see that a lot? Yeah. So one of the things that's really been interesting about building the business is you want everything to happen so fast. And so I'll see these other lawyers that I know I see at these legal conferences and they're doing, you know, 80, 90, hundred million dollars in revenue. And two years ago we did one and then we did four last year and we just had our eight figure year in 2023. So man, if know, I had a drop in bombs, but yeah. I'll push it. <laughs> <laughs> we're on our way. But here's the thing that's interesting is like, you can only go from like one to four, to 13, Mm. to, you know, you can't go from one to 80. Mm -hmm. And I think me, like every young entrepreneur, they want to go from one to 80. And you realize, you know, it's somebody's life work, decades of how they got to 80 to 100 million. And you have to go through the steps of like, Mm -hmm. first becoming financially free, making, you know, five grand a month, not from a corporate job, and Mm -hmm. then 10 grand a month. And then you have your first million dollar year. And then you do multiple millions. And then you have your first eight figure year. And it's like, that's the path to getting there. And there's no like cheat code. It's all hard work. One thing that's interesting is If you think something is a great opportunity, it might just be that you really don't have detailed information about the industry or about the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Because if you knew more about it, you would realize that it's not easy. There is no easy opportunity out there. All of them take work. All of them take becoming an expert. Mm -hmm. And I always recommend people follow where there's success, right? Like I saw all these personal injury lawyers that were having these big businesses that were having planes you know, I didn't say I want to be the first of some other category. All I said is, hey, I want to join this category where people seem to be doing pretty well, but I'm going to put my unique top dog flavor on it. I'm going to do things slightly differently yeah. in my own variation. But that was a opportunity vehicle that others were winning at already. Mm-hmm. So true. We can dive into that because we were talking off camera, talking about things that are boring things that are simple, try not to recreate something Mm. like keep going because it's so true. I think even myself, when I first started growth house, I'm like, I'm going to do all this and that. And it's going to be something that's never been done before. I'm like, stuff like this has been done before. Yeah. And then also what you said earlier is play to your strengths Mm. and know what those are, figure out what you're good at. And that's what you ended up doing. Yeah, so the, I love that. The, the money's in the the simple, boring businesses, Mm. um, the businesses where, other people are doing them successfully. And yes, you might be able to add some form of disruption. Like for us, right? There were a bunch of lawyers that got really big in television commercials Mm -hmm. and in billboards. And we came in and we were able to do that same play, but on social media. And because of my age, right? My competitors were 60 and Mm -hmm. I was 28, Mm -hmm. right? And so I was kind of native social media and I was able to take that same approach, but do it more social media heavy, right? But that's a minor twist on an overall successful business. And I think what a lot of people do is they jump right to how do I create a new category of business? How do I create something where, you know, nobody has done this before, but it's such a great idea and I'm going to be the person to do it. And I think the hard truth in a lot of those scenarios is the reason there aren't big businesses doing exactly what you're doing is because the unit economics of that business don't Scalability. work. Yeah, it's like yeah. either either people don't want to pay for that, right? Like they're not coming out of their wallet to, you know, buy lots and lots of your product or service or you know, the economics of it, meaning like how much does it cost you to provide that service or to make that product compared to what you make by selling it are not scalable. And so, you know, I think just realizing like you're not a genius, you know, it's like that simple. It's like, you're not, you know, the next Mark Zuckerberg, right? Like, but that doesn't mean you can't be like, there's plenty of seven, eight figure entrepreneurs living in multi-million dollar houses, Mm -hmm. driving Ferraris, that have plumbing companies. Yeah. Like you don't, you don't have to create the next Facebook. Like Mm -hmm. you can find a business industry that, you know, you can put your slant on it. You can provide really good customer service, have really good marketing and do the thing really well and make millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. On the topic of scale, we even use like a lot of people are in the position where they got their business to about six figures. 
that's kind of like the first step, right? From six to seven, what was that transition like for you? Was it hiring key people? Was it extra organization? What did that look like for you? Business is like the ultimate personal growth. And so because you're doing and learning all these things that you were never taught. And I think one thing I've heard is that usually getting to seven figures is having one channel of acquisition that works really well. So my experience was that that was Instagram, right? We were really good at building a following on our top dog law account. I think we have uh, 299,000 followers. So, you know, we'd appreciate you know, that extra, <laughs> that extra couple hundred we need. No, but, uh, we, you know, we had built that channel and we were getting calls and DMs and leads through that channel and we were running paid ads and it was like, we got to a million bucks through that one channel of acquiring customers. And I think to get from 1 million to eight figures, it's like you have to have multiple acquisition channels. So that's one point is like, I think most people try to focus on like doing seven different social medias, right? It's like, how about you just have one social media platform Mm -hmm. that you're actually consistent on that you actually drive customers to and that you actually convert those customers and make money. And then once you build that one social media platform to a million dollar channel for you, Mm -hmm. then you can worry about like having, you know, all the different social media platforms. Um, So good. I want to say, you want to continue or you want me? I got a question. No, go ahead. All right. So you found out where your target demographic, target audience is. Yeah. And then you decided on Instagram or you're like, whatever platform, when I start posting, it starts blowing up. Let's just double down on that. I wish I could say it was totally strategic, right? The the reality is it was probably a little bit of both. I went on this trip in uh, 2019 to Bali with a bunch of entrepreneurs from Philly. I I like to tell this story. So I played basketball with these guys. um, And it's funny, they're all now in Atlanta, like circle of CEOs are crushing it, right? And we went to Bali and they were making tons of money off their Instagram. And Funny enough, I didn't even have an Instagram account. Like I was. Wait, this is 2019. 2019. You had no Instagram. I had no Instagram. And like my boys, when I was in my partying days, would be like, dude, you're sleeping. Yeah. Like, how are you going out and you don't have a way to like get a girl's Instagram account? <laughs> right. Like, I wasn't into it. And then I saw all of these guys that were making money through using it as a promotional tool. Mm. And that was what opened my eyes was like, I was trying to do this lawyer thing, but I was figuring out how can I compete with these lawyers that are spending millions of dollars on the traditional media platforms. And then I saw these other guys in other industries doing it on social media. And I was like, oh, I wonder if I could combine these two things. Mm -hmm. And that's how I started with Instagram. I think the other part, in addition to your social media strategy is when you first start, and even if you're making like a couple hundred grand a year, you're really doing everything as the entrepreneur. And so like you are involved in the marketing, you are involved in the actual operations of creating the product or making the service. You're involved in the HR of like hiring and recruiting new people to join your company. You're meeting with the accountant to Mm -hmm. go over the financials. And I think as you go from six figures to seven figures and then seven figures to eight figures, you start to identify which are those areas that like you suck at, right? This is back to the strengths. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I'm better on the sales and marketing side than I am in the operations. So my first, I think eight hires we're all operations people Mm. because I'm like, I can be a beast on the promotion and sales front. Like I can literally hold down this section of the business just myself and Mm. I'll do a great job and I'll love it. Yeah. But this part of the business, I need help, you know? And so it's like, I think from getting to that seven figure mark was hiring people at that one area that I'm not good at. So what were like the first one to two hires and then how'd you hire them? Because I know a lot of people, have no idea. I mean, they go from corporate to trying to side hustle that becomes a business. Yeah. And then they're like, I don't know how to hire anyone. And they go through 12 VAs to try to figure out the right one. Yeah. What was your process? So one thing I did do that I think was a little counterintuitive is I actually hired a full-time videographer, like a marketing person Mm. was my first hire. And that was mostly because I did have some capital that I knew I could use, right? Like if I didn't have any money at all, I probably wouldn't have done that. But I think what that did is it really did force me to start creating content for my business and start generating leads because I knew like a lot of people focus on having the perfect website or getting their LLC or doing this or doing that. But 
I knew because I had studied enough of these law firms that like the key was getting the phone to ring. Mm. So I was like, if I can put all my initial energy on like, how do I get like customers Mm -hmm. even before you have your LLC, before you have anything, like how can I have people who want my service or my product? And so for me, that was investing in the videographer. And then once I started to prove, I still remember this was June of 2019, literally my phone started to ring and I was like, I think I had a a virtual receptionist. So like a, you can pay like per minute to like a call Ruby or one of these services that'll pick up and say, Hey, top dog law. And then they'll call you. And then if it's a customer, they'll three-way the call to you. So so that was one of the things that makes you look like a little bit more professional when you're not (laughs) professional, you know. But also, you know, it protects your time from like, you know, spam and other kinds of calls that you would pick up by yourself. But I still remember the fear when the phone actually rang and it was like a customer. It was like I wanted so hard this thing to happen, which was like people to call me about their accident case. But then when they did, it was like I panicked, right? It was like oh crap like you know because i was literally so focused on how do i just get the phone to ring Mm -hmm. and i think that was the right attitude though because then the phone started ringing once a week then once a day then twice a day then five times a day then five times an hour then 20 times an hour you know and it's like as those calls came in then i quickly moved to okay i need to hire my first ops people and so your question to answer directly was well where did i get those people I made ads on Indeed Mm -hmm. and I posted those ads in Indeed and then I met with all the people that interviewed for those positions myself and I tried to hire people who had done the thing before Hmm. because I didn't know how to train them because I had never done it, (laughs) right? right? So it was like, I think a little hack to like, you know, get qualified people is to overpay them. Usually what someone in that salary makes. So for me, it was, you know, a a personal injury, pre-litigation paralegal, Maybe they typically make 60 grand a year. Well, maybe I'll pay 90 grand a year, Hmm. but I'll pay 90 grand a year to get somebody that's done it for 10 years. And the reason why is because they can teach me more than I can teach them, Mm -hmm. you know? And, And that was kind of a strategy I used in the beginning was I even did this with my executive assistant. You know, she had worked for a sports agency and I was like, I don't know how to use an executive assistant. Like I've never had an executive assistant. Like I need her to teach me what an executive assistant does. So it's like, rather than going and saying, I'm going to get like the cheapest person. It's like, maybe I'll actually get like an experienced person. That's like near the top of the salary range, but they can teach me what to do and not the other way around. You know, I think this is especially true when you're a young entrepreneur, like even now in my management team. So we have a, ma- we have about 52 employees. We have a management team of like six people that oversee the company. I'm still the youngest person on the management team. Wow. So it's like, you know, I, some of that's insecurity when you're young, but then some of that is also true that other people do have more experience than you. And if you can advertise and on job boards, right, you can advertise the position and get people in there who've already done the thing, Mm -hmm. you can move a lot faster. I love that. And because we're on the topic of, you know, employees and people working with you, company culture, I feel like that's something that you're really heavy on. We talk about a lot when we go on hikes together and, you know, just growing that team and you want to instill the vision and the values and the mission of the company. Where'd you learn all that? Because I know we got books everywhere in this house. Is that something that you dive heavy into? Like books, who's some of the people that you look up to in that, in that realm? I think that when I first heard culture, I almost like rolled my eyes to the back of my head. Hmm. I had a a friend, he was actually the one who had that marketing agency that I started in where we sold marketing to lawyers. That was watching him get from zero to 1 million Mm -hmm. was so unbelievably helpful because I think what it did in my head was it was just like, holy crap, this is possible. Like I literally sat in the business of somebody else and watched them start with no money and have their first million dollar year. Mm. And I was the the biggest business originator for that person. Mm-hmm. And just going through that experience, like switched the light bulb that like, this is possible and I can do it. And he would always preach how important culture was. And I would almost like roll my eyes into the back of my head because I was like, that's, that's crazy. But what you realize as you gain more and more people, all culture is if the founder could be working with every employee, how would you tell them what the company does and how they do things and the attitude they need to have and how you want them to work? All it is, is trying to multiply 
that value that I would give any employee that I'm working with one-on-one times all 52 people across our organization. And so how can we take my, I would say, attitude on business, my priorities, what's important to me about business, and how can I synthesize that into like four or five core values and a couple of key concepts that I just repeat over and over and over and over again Mm -hmm. to get to a point where everybody in the company is sick of hearing them. But then what I have is like my leadership team members who report to me are repeating the things that I'm saying to their subordinates who are then reporting those things to their subordinates, right? And they say leadership all starts at the top and it's like people watch how you treat people. They watch how you work, what kind of work ethic you have. They watch your attitude. You know, one of our core values is upbeat personality, right? It's like, like that. all those things that I do, every one of my employees see me do those things. And mm. they understand that like, hey, this is how this company is. And so, you know, we hire and fire by those values. We rate people. You're either a, a plus for each one of our, so our core values are upbeat personality, always improving, committed to the organization and reliable. Mm, I and, love those. and we score all of our employees during the first 90 day probationary period on those core values. And um, if somebody isn't a core value fit, they get fired. Mm-hmm. And it's really become kind of the bar for working here. I think that's how you, A players want to work with A players. And so it's like, that's how you keep a culture where B and C players just feel very uncomfortable. This is so good. And this is stuff that I'm talking about with a lot of my friends because they're in that period of life and in their business right now where they are trying to scale. Mm -hmm. And so this resonates so much. So I know people listening, this resonates. Let's go back to branding real quick. No matter what the industry is, you're really looking at two key KPIs, right? So it's What's your cost to acquire a customer? So people will use the abbreviation CPA, right? Cost per acquisition compared to LTV. What is the lifetime value of that customer? And that's, you know, if that customer is on a recurring payment schedule, then that might be, you know, several years because it's based on however long customers typically stick with your company. You know, you'll calculate your churn rate and then you'll figure out what's your lifetime value of customer. For me, you know, it's an accident. A lot of times people just have one car accident. So for me, it's just what's my average customer worth for one case, right? And so round numbers here for me, call it five grand. That means that I have five grand that I can make off of every customer after I sign them two years later, usually two to three years later. Mm. Well, okay. Then what can I spend to acquire a customer? Well, five grand minus whatever the cost of capital is, because I have to hold that for two years. But obviously the cheaper I can acquire a customer, the more I can make on that profit. And I think to tie this back to content creators or building a personal brand, you know, I don't have a personal brand. At some point I might. The Top Dog Law brand is huge, Mm -hmm. but I've really kept that brand less about James and more about this is Top Dog Law. This is what the brand does because eventually I might not own Top Dog Law anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So the more that that's about James actually hurts me because it makes it less investable. It makes it less sellable. And so the way I try to think about it is the Top Dog Law channel is all about personal injury origination. Mm. And all I measure off of that channel is what are we spending to grow that channel? What are we spending per lead? How many leads does it take us on that channel to get a case? And then how does the cost per acquisition compare to the lifetime value of the customer? And so I think a lot of people, quite frankly, like putting out content and like getting likes and like getting comments and whatever, but there's no real purpose behind the content. And I think one of the things for us, and this has grown as, you know, now we have, you know, a five person marketing team. We have other people that are working on growing, not just our Instagram, but our other social media platforms. But we have a weekly meeting where, yeah, we look at how many followers did we gain that week? And we look at, you know, how the the posts are doing, but the most important metrics are how many calls did we get to the number in our bio? How many form submissions did we get off that Instagram? How much did we spend? Right. And so I think it's just looking at your brand and trying to step back and think, what is the goal here? If the goal is to drive customers to like one specific product or service your business is offering, how well are you actually doing that through your organic content? 
So good. And I think you you do a great combination of organic content, mm. but then also paid through billboards, through radio, yeah. et cetera. You know what? I have a friend. His name is Brian. And he basically was able to create a seven-figure business through organic content, mostly through Instagram. But now he's realizing, all right, to get to that next level, to get to the eight-figure version of himself, mm. he's realizing he needs to step into paid advertisement. Talk to me about that transition for you. Did it happen before? I think you started organic, right? Yeah. And then you went into paid advertisement. So walk me through that journey because I'm actually curious myself. Yeah. So that's actually Brian's story is exactly my story. I mean, we hit the seven figure mark largely with organic content and the blessing of doing it with organic content is your cost per acquisition so is dirt cheap because <laughs> it's really just creativity and hustle that has blown up your account so that you're getting these like quote unquote free inquiries, which is great. But the problem is there isn't unlimited scalability off your organic content, right? Like if you want to grow, if you want to triple your business this year, well, you might not exactly have the formula to triple your organic pages. And you don't know if, if, if your page grows from 100,000 to 300,000 followers, will you get three times as many leads? Maybe. Will those leads convert at the same percentage? Maybe. But if you can find a paid solution, you can basically take the profits from what you made on your organic channels. This is what we did, right? Re and then reinvest those profits into trying out paid, right? Because I think the problem a lot of people have is they try paid ads and then they say, oh, this doesn't work. Mm. And it's like, no, there's tons of people making money off Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. You just didn't have it work on your first attempt. And that could have been related to the ad you were running. That could have been related to the copy that you were associated with that ad. And so it's like, we just tried, whether it was radio or billboards or social media ads or Google pay-per-click, we just took our profits and we called it R&D. We just invested into all these different paid channels and some worked better than others. The ones that worked well, we doubled, then tripled, then quadrupled. And eventually you're like, oh crap, I have this thing, this new channel that it costs me, like take radio for example, it costs me more to acquire a client than it did through my organic channels, mm -hmm. but it's still profitable. Right. And here's the good part. I can predictably say if I spend this amount of money, I can make this amount of money back. And so, you know, we've scaled our radio spend where we're spending like a million dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we're doing that is we started at 30 grand a month. Then we went to 50 grand. Then we went to 70 grand. And that whole time we're measuring how many leads are we getting from this? Is this working? You know, and that's what you can do, whether it's Facebook ads or Google or radio or television commercials, no matter what the channel is, it's all that same principle of now that you have money to, from organic to actually invest in paid, you do R and D, you find out what paid channel works, and then you slowly but steady, just grow that paid channel until it doesn't work anymore. And Fortunately, we haven't had that problem yet. So. <laughs> How much are you spending right now? Yeah. So, marketing? Yeah. So we're coming close to $2 million a month on marketing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So two questions there. I'm not on that exact topic, but when you're looking at R&D, looking at these other paid channels for advertisement, how much percentage did you say I'm going to allocate towards trying this new paid strategy out? So I think to back up, traditionally businesses spend like 20% of their revenues on marketing. We run a lead gen company. So one of the things that's been fun about our business is we're like almost inverted, right? We spend like 70% of our revenues on marketing, which we're in growth mode, right? So at some point we're going to like that marketing expenditure as a percentage of gross revenue is going to decrease because we're going to start taking more profits off the table and not reinvesting in more growth. But whatever your percentage is that you're spending on marketing, I think taking, you know, 20% of your marketing budget and always using that to test new channels or new ads on existing channels is the only way you're going to grow. So like even now, you know, we're looking at two new marketing channels. And I said, hey, let's take 10 grand for each one of these channels. Let's put it in in February. Let's measure how it does. And then we'll report back. I mean, we were just on the beta for TikTok launched a click to call ad. Mm. And we were the only law firm that did it. And it didn't work at all. <laughs> you should have said that. <laughs> like, dang it, you know? But all jokes aside, like, 
I'm almost proud that we did that. Yeah. And like, we're still, we'll test out like OTT, which is streaming. And we're, we test YouTube and we still do run like non click to call TikTok ads. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, again, first million dollars, find one channel that works and just do that to get to a million bucks. Because if your business is going to work, you have to be able to do that. And then mm -hmm. once you've like achieved that and you start to have profits that come in, I think it's important to take a percentage of those profits, 20% of your marketing budget or so, mm -hmm. and put that into trying new things. Because if you do find a winner, the amount of value you're going to be able to extract from that winning channel is unbelievable. Double down, like you said. Yeah. Last question on this topic. Did you try to learn all this yourself? Did you hire... Did you buy a course? Did you just say, I'm going to hire the best people that have done paid advertisements? How'd you start doing that? I would say a little bit of everything. I mean, I think as a general rule, the gems are in the books. Mm -hmm. You know, the books are $20. And mm -hmm. it's like, I can't think of something I've gotten more value out of than like, you know, read Russell Brunson's Traffic Secrets. That'll be on Amazon. It's $25. It's probably more value in that book than you'd get in any $5,000 or $10,000 course, mm -hmm. right? So I've read a lot of books. I like love entrepreneurship. I'm obsessed with it. I study it. I talk to tons of other people that are into marketing. Mm -hmm. I think more than any of those things, I've just been in the arena now for five years spending money, trial and error, like a lot of lessons, wasted tons of money, you know, like I've just been doing it, you yeah. know, the more I've been in the game, the more I realize like expertise, there's nothing that's a better value. And, and I know you follow Patrick, Bet David, yeah. he said this, right? Like the way to get wealthy is to like, get really knowledgeable about one vertical. And he did that in the life insurance space, you know, over 20 years. And, you know, just being in the life insurance space, you learn all the details about life insurance. And we were talking off camera. It's like somebody will come in and say, hey, I know of this really good opportunity in the life insurance space. And it's like, no, you don't. You don't know enough information to even know where the good opportunities lie. It's like the people that find the good opportunities are the Patrick Bet Davids mm -hmm. that have been in life insurance for five years and know all the nuances. And like, that's what I'm trying to do inside of the legal vertical is, you know, right now, Top Dog is a lead gen platform in legal. But like, I think there's plenty of other businesses within the legal vertical that I could build on the back of Top Dog, or maybe at some point I become an investor in, or maybe I even I start one of them, right? And it's mm -hmm. like the only reason I have that expertise in that one particular vertical is just spending, you know, years yeah. absorbing, you know? No squirrel syndrome. Yeah, no squirrel <laughs> syndrome. <laughs> but talk about mistakes though. Like, bro, I think last year I spent $40,000 on legal ideas like i basically i spent twenty thousand dollars going down the rabbit hole of creating two new businesses only to get to the end of drawing out the llcs and the operating agreements and the business contracts and being like what the heck am i doing <laughs> yeah. like my all i need to do is just stay focused on the business yeah. but for entrepreneurs that's the hardest thing i struggle with it is just how do i just <clears throat> keep the main thing the main thing Especially, like you said, like at, a, at the end of the day, it starts getting quote unquote boring when you're like, I know this is going to work. I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to see if something else is around here. Yeah. It's a girl in the red dress, right. right? Because the whole equation I explained earlier about cost per acquisition and lifetime value, it's like, it's boring. It's, it's money making, but it's boring to, you know, take a thousand dollars put it into this marketing channel, generate $3,000, wait six months, take $5,000, put it in that marketing channel, generate $15,000, mm -hmm. wait six months, put in $15,000, right? It's like, instead your brain goes to like, what's the way I can get rich quick? You know? You know? <laughs> Even though you're already doing it, if you just stay there. <laughs> yeah, you just got you just got to stay there, you yeah. know? But talk to me about the power of who you surround yourself with. You know, the growth house motto is you become who you surround yourself with. You even mentioned one of the turning points in your life and in your business was getting around that mastermind group in Bali, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So talk to me about the power of masterminds, about the power of putting yourself in maybe even uncomfortable positions, situations to go meet new people and the effect that's had on your life. Well, 
shout out the growth house. I still remember immersion. Oh my gosh. Yes, that, sir. Our growth house boot camp, man. Yeah, let's go. There's definitely something to putting yourself around other people that are taking risks and that are at that kind of delicate place of believing in themselves enough to start a business or to, to go all in on an idea or to double down on a business, right? But are going through the trials and tribulations of like being in the arena of, of doing it. And for me, I've always tried to have like an inner circle of five people that are playing as big as I'm playing mm. or, or trying to really get to that next level. And for me, there are people I've met at legal conferences or masterminds or out on the basketball court and then going to Bali. And I'll be honest, this is one of the tough things about growing is some of those people, I feel like as I've continued to scale my business, I've kind of moved on from that relationship. And, you know, it doesn't mean that if they reach out to me, I'm not available. I'm not here to help. I don't support them. But I've leveled up out of the conversations we were having, mm -hmm. right? And I think sometimes, and I even look back at like some of my high school friends and college friends like this, right? It's like a lot of them still all hang out together. You know, mm. my high school friends all hang out together. My college friends all hang out together. My law school friends all hang out together. You know, the Philly lawyers community that I was a part of all hangs out together. And it's like, as I've kind of gone in my journey it's not that i haven't created relationships there and it's not like they're meaningful but like i'm spending more and more time with the people on the level i'm at now 100 percent. and uh i think it's important so good community i feel like community is really big for you because i always see you going back to philly you're you're in there like you're you're doing I don't know exactly what you would call them, but you're speaking to the students. Yeah. You're hanging out. Yeah. You're giving your story. In the mix, your, baby. You're in the mix. He's really out there. <laughs> yeah. He's in the street still. Yeah. That, dude, that was one of the things actually, though, as a lawyer, like one of my differentiators early on was, you know, lawyer was the stuffy guy in the suit and tie on the billboard. Mm -hmm. Not relatable, not approachable compared to the, the people that are actually your everyday person in the community. And uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is this is our second year in a row. We've raised over $100,000 through a community center. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. We, we raised that. Um, it's not just us. You know, shout out to all our law firm and doctor partners that have contributed. But like being the plug allowed me to do that, right? Mm. Like I give all of the organizations that contributed business. And so, you know, if you're somebody who wants to be a philanthropist, there's no better way than raise money from people who depend on your business for their business, right? Like, yeah. of course, they're going to support what I'm doing because I'm making them tons and tons of money. And so, you know, I don't feel bad about then going them and asking like, hey, you know, we're all doing really well. Like, here's this thing I'm doing. It means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. Could you put some money in? And, um, as I've tried to like grow and be successful, like I don't want to be the guy always rolling around with like a security team or mm. that is like totally unresponsive, right? Like or inaccessible. Like I want to be somebody who is down to earth. One of the things I'm working on is like not being on my phone. Like as you can imagine, I mean, my phone just from like business stuff always has issues. And so really trying when I'm with somebody like to be with that person mm -hmm. and not be on my phone. And I think that, you know, if you're in a business, the more you can be in touch with your customers and really like stay in their shoes. There's a story about like Brian Chesky, who was the founder of Airbnb, mm -hmm. went around and lived out of Airbnbs for like a year. Bro went to like a new Airbnb every day and did that. Or Jeff Bezos has him and his executive team are on the customer support line. So like one day you'll be calling Amazon, your package <laughs> didn't show up and you really got Jeff this Bezos. Jeff? Yeah, <laughs> you really got Jeff Bezos. But it's like, there's a reason they do that. Like, yeah. like, well, I'll go work in my call center and I'll go like, we have 35 call center reps. I'll go work a day in the life of a call center rep. And it's like, you know, you're not doing that to be able to talk about that on podcasts about you yeah. doing that. You're doing that because you realize in that experience, like, oh, I could make this part of the business way easier. Like, oh, I didn't realize that they have to do this. Like, this is crazy. Like, how, how can we fix that? Right. It's mm -hmm. like, 
the more you can do that with your clients or later with your employees, you learn from it and you, you improve the process for everybody. One of one thing that I really love about you, man, besides like you have just always infectious energy, always positive. I think that's something that drew us together because I think Thank we're very you, similar yeah. in that way. Yeah, you have great energy. I appreciate it. Yeah, every room you come in, people are like, oh, dude, Jesse's here. Like, like everybody starts <laughs> I don't smiling. Know about all that. Yeah, everybody starts <laughs> smiling, bro. Yeah, you really do that, bro, though, seriously. I appreciate yeah. that. But I want to I talk about you're a lifelong learner. And where I was going with that is... You talked about Growth House, you know, our entrepreneur boot camp we had last year. And probably the person that asked the most and best questions was you, bro. Mm. Like, you were at a certain period in your business, and we had a couple people, not many, who were, you know, further along than you in business. Mm -hmm. But when they were talking, you were taking notes. Yeah. You were the first one raising your hand. And I'm looking around at other people who, you know, should be the ones asking the questions, but I'm like, this guy is dedicated to his craft. He wants to learn, hungry, no ego. And it was just amazing to watch. And that, that left a lasting impression on me. I just want you to know that. I appreciate you saying that. I think a lot of that comes down to like drive, to how driven you are. I, I take this and this, you know, you might even say that this has something to do with my addictive nature, my obsessed personality, right? Like that's what led me astray. And whether it's like work or sometimes I even do it with fitness, right? It's like, it can work on the other way too. It's like, it all comes down to dopamine, right? And mm. it's like, I get that dopamine hit from working out and I get that dopamine hit from growing and evolving and becoming the best business person I could be. And like, for me, I realize, you know, I might not be the professional athlete, right? Like I might not have had the genetics to ever be an athlete, but I really think on the business stuff, like I believe in myself. I believe in my ability to figure it out. I believe in my trajectory. And so it's like when you're that driven and you know this is something that you have like hyper competence in, you're really going to strive to maximize your potential. And like, I think with the growth house, for example, it's like addiction, right? You can't want somebody else to get sober. You can't want somebody to build that business. But what you can do is you can provide that place where the people that are going to show up and they are going to be driven and they are going to be obsessed and they are going to ask the questions, mm -hmm. they're going to take advantage of it. But those are the only people that are going to take advantage of it. And you, ca you so can't true. have the people that aren't that way take advantage of it that's up mm -hmm. to them you know so true and business has you know when not straight up but it's been growing a lot right the last four or five years yeah so i'm even scared to ask the question where are you going to be in another four to five <laughs> years because who knows but let's just say two to three like what's on the horizon for top dog mr james let's go some of the things i love about 2024 is we have our whole business plan built out and basically we have no constraints, right? Like the mm. things that worked for us in 2023, there's no reason why we can't just duplicate them in 2024 at a larger scale. So actually a shiny object syndrome, my 2024 is like, how can I just keep doing what I did at the end of 2023, but slightly bigger, like with slightly more money, with slightly better returns, right? How can I do that in 2024? And then after 2024, you know, one of the things that I've really been spending a lot of time focusing on, and this is a big hack when you get to that level where you start to think about, maybe I'm not going to sell my business, but I want to maximize the value of my business to have that optionality, right? Is spending time around money guys. So investment bankers, private equity professionals, people on that other side of the equation from entrepreneurs. And one of the things that I've done to really learn about that world is I have a friend of mine I went to college with and funny story like him and I, you know, he was in my party days and he was the president of his fraternity. And like, we did some crazy stuff <laughs> together. And so we reconnected after like 10 years. And, uh, when I saw him, the first thing I was like, I just don't want him to like, think of me how he probably thinks of me, you know, like I was all insecure, but, uh, we laughed and then, uh, caught up and we ended up becoming really good friends. And he actually sends me over pitch decks. So entrepreneurs that are taking their business and trying to sell their business, they put together basically a PowerPoint presentation. 
that outlines their entire business, their strategy, how they do marketing, how they do ops, what are their financials, right? Because they want a private equity firm to see that pitch deck and want to invest in them. And I've just been looking at a ton of pitch decks in my mm. industry because I want to then ask him a bunch of questions, right? Just like the growth house, like, wait, what does this mean? Wait, is this help his value or hurt his value? Why? Because it's like through having that information, you can reverse engineer the value that you're building in your business. And it's funny because these bankers, they don't know what it's like to be an entrepreneur, to start a business from scratch. Mm -hmm. And us entrepreneurs, we don't have the information of the other businesses in our category and how they do things. And so it's like, I'm trying to kind of live at that intersection mm -hmm. and learn about things more from their perspective so that when I approach it from the entrepreneurial angle, now I'm like, okay, I know what they're looking for. And so I'm going to, you know, build my business accordingly. I love that. Yeah. <clears throat> I think I'm just learning this past year when you start a business, like you said, maybe you don't have any intention of wanting to sell it, but it's always nice having the option. Mm. And so what are some, maybe one or two tips that if you were looking back on your own business or maybe, you know, someone else's business that is just, just starting, what should someone be looking to do? Like, for example, let me give you a quick example that I'm learning. Better to have monthly, monthly recurring revenue rather than just, you know, a one-time, mm. you know, income source, revenue source. Yeah. So I think it comes back to that concept of opportunity vehicle, right? We talked about in the beginning of the podcast, like pick the areas of business where tons of people are winning and they're winning big, right? It's like, you don't want to climb halfway up the mountain and then realize, oh crap, this isn't the right mountain. Mm. And so I think if you can look at your industry and how they're selling for it, I think what I know now, if I could go back is I would evaluate what are the investable categories? Like, what are the categories where the bankers are paying lots of money for the businesses? Like you, you talked about it, right? Like recurring revenue is a great one. Obviously, any kind of software business. I mean, those, you get multiples on your revenue as opposed to your profit. That's a huge deal. I mean, like I said, we did 13 something million this year, but that wasn't what we actually made in profit because we spent so much on marketing, right? Mm -hmm. But they're getting actually a multiple on the revenue, not on the profit, Man. which is crazy. And that's, you know, just in tech or software, or you look at these other categories where there's different roll-ups or, or other things going on and you, you start to reverse engineer, okay, what are the things that banks, and they're smart, uh, that they find valuable and their signal that they're putting out to the entrepreneurs that like, hey, we find your thing valuable is their willingness to give you that high multiple on it or to give you a multiple of revenue as opposed to a multiple of earnings. And so I would just learn more about that. And potentially if I had already started a business, I would think, how can I construct my financial model to better put me in a position for some of these private equity firms. I'm going to an event in April at Princeton. It's like a five day fellowship. And that's all this event is about. It's about capital market readiness and financial market transformation. And all it is, is a bunch of Wall Street bank guys meeting with a bunch of entrepreneurs that do at least 5 million a year and looking at all your business models and saying, how can you maximize your business to be worth more money. And I think the event's like 20 K, mm -hmm. but for someone in my position, that's a no brainer because it's like, Hey, if I can, instead of getting seven X, my earnings get nine X, my earnings. I mean, that's way different than 20 K, you know, <laughs> you're literally getting the cheat code on how yeah, to do it. <laughs> yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah, man. This is probably one of my favorite podcasts. Let's go. Like so much value. I'm going to go back and take notes on this. Mm. Like I wish I had a notepad right now. So you ready for some fun questions? Yeah, let's yeah, get a little, it. A little quick ones. Yeah. I actually want to ask this in two ways. <clears throat> for someone starting out and trying to get to their first, let's say six figures, what book or podcast would you recommend someone listen to? So the one, I'll just tell you the one that I listened to mm -hmm. was Grant Cardone, 10X Rule. Yeah. Uh, that uh, philosophy of putting yourself out there, one of the hardest things for me when I first started, especially in lawyer, right, legal category, because like lawyers are thought of as like, you know, suits, ties, speaking, corporate, mumbo jumbo. And I went out there and was like, what's up, y'all? You know, like <laughs> making I, rap videos, yeah, making rap videos, <laughs> doing crazy stuff. And, and part of how I got that confidence though, was watch reading Grant Cardone and 
hearing his talks about attention, attention, attention. Mm. The whole game is to get attention. The marketplace is really loud. And the most important thing is not, you know, your customer service. It's getting people to know you. Mm. You know, he says, if they don't know you, they can't flow you. And he motivated me to, mm. you know, not be afraid, not be so afraid to really put myself out there in a way that would get me attention because that initial attention is what led to me getting to that first million dollar mark. Uncle G. All right. So what about someone scaling? Someone going from six to seven and then seven to eight. What's a podcast or book that you would recommend? So we run our company on EOS. EOS is based on the book Traction. It's the Entrepreneurial Operating System. It's basically a practical guide for how to set up accountability in an organization, how to manage people. And we talked about this in the beginning of the pod, like you have no class in school that's like how to manage other people. And that book isn't like a, like case studies or stories. It's like this is what you do. Like, here's the meeting and here's the meeting agenda, mm. right? And so the problem is that book isn't for that first category of entrepreneur, you know? You need to have a leadership team. So even if your leadership team is like one or two other people in your organization and maybe you have like eight total employees or 10 total employees, I think that's the perfect time to really like absorb yourself in EOS. And it's helped us go from, you know, 10 to 52 and be able to do it in a way where everybody knows where they sit on the accountability chart. Everyone knows what their roles and responsibilities to are. Everybody knows what their KPIs are, the numbers that they're going to be graded on. Everybody knows who they report to, right? I didn't know any of that stuff. And that book taught me a lot. Great book. Morning routine. Do you have one? Is it important to you? Thoughts? Hmm. So I like to work out when I wake up, mostly because if I don't do it first thing in the morning, I just don't do it. Yeah. Um, that's just kind of how I am. Wake up early. I mean, I wake up 5.30, um, 5.45, no alarm. Um, no alarm. No alarm. All I do is wake up and work out. And some days, if I'm not doing that, I'll just wake up and, and work right away. Because at least for me, I have the clearest thought in the beginning of the day mm -hmm. by, you know, two onwards, I'm not great in terms of like actually doing strategic work where I have to think a lot. Mm -hmm. So I'll try to schedule like if I have something I have to do with my assistant or I have to go to the bank or I have to meet with my accountant, I'll try to schedule that for the late afternoon. And then I'll try to do like my hardest work in the morning. Love it. Best advice that you would have for, let's just put you in your own shoes, James at you know, in, in your 20s, mm. you're just starting off. Maybe you have a couple, you know, rough starts to a business you're trying. Got yeah. a couple L's, some learning lessons. What advice would you give to that person? Well, I think the most obvious one for me is that you were taking one step forward and three steps back every time you were ingesting chemicals. And by chemicals, I mean alcohol or drugs. Mm. I think it would be impossible for me to be sitting where I am today if I was still doing those things. Um, I think other people, you know, have different tendencies, but I would say even if you don't have an addiction issue, if you're going out and partying and staying out late and drinking, it's really hard to wake up the next day and then be able to do the same level of output that if you didn't do that. I look at sobriety as my superpower because if you think about it for seven years, I've been on my game mm. every single day, you know, and it's like, how can you not say that's an advantage? That's so good. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm seven days in. Let's go. <laughs> no, honestly, on a, on a serious note, I've felt last year, like, I'm someone who likes to drink. Yeah. Like, I'm, but socially, I will. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it's 12 o'clock. I'm like, I'm tired, but if I'm going to stay out, if I'm going to need another drink just to wake up. And then the next day, it's like, I'm just foggy. Yeah. Like, even I'm not getting drunk, but still, I'm still not feeling like I'm on top of my game. And the last couple of years, then it's not just one day after. Now, on day three... I'm like still 75%. Mm. And I just like to be clear focused. Yeah. You know, what's funny is, you know, obviously there's people that I would put in my category, which is like true addiction issues. Mm -hmm. But what I've noticed more and more is the younger generation being open to like, hey, I'm just like not going to get drunk. And like some people even saying like, I'm going to experience what it's like to be sober for six months or a year. Mm -hmm. And like, I tend to believe that if you didn't drink alcohol for a full year, there's probably a small chance that you would then go back to drinking. You would probably so just go to the bar and just order a mocktail. Mm -hmm. And you'd be like, oh, I'm cool.
it is really a superpower when you have the alcohol courage the confidence when you're sober yeah i think once yeah. you hit that yeah like that's a superpower itself yeah so i'm on a six months so i started january 1st let's go So six months no alcohol really yeah are you like committing committing oh i'm 100 all right all right it's nice you guys got that <laughs> we got it on camera so <laughs> uh what was my other question anything i haven't asked you to talk about or touch on I guess I would just say that entrepreneurship is hard. It's been glorified a lot. And there's a lot of people that want the independence of working for yourself. Uh, but there's a big difference from being self-employed and being able to, to live and pay your rent and pay for your food and stuff with, you know, out having a corporate job versus actually building an entrepreneurial organization. And I'm not saying that to say that building an entrepreneurial organization is better. It's just different. And it's a lot, a lot of work. And, uh, you know, I think it takes a special breed of person to do it. And the people who I think are good at it, love the journey and are not doing it for an outcome. And that's where I would put myself is like, I just feel grateful to be able to like, build this thing and like to gain these skills and to learn what it's like to go from six to seven figures and to learn what it's like to go from 10 employees to 50. And it's like, that's how sometimes you think, I think about selling the business is like, you know, the problem with selling is I wouldn't learn what it's like mm -hmm. to go from eight to nine figures. I wouldn't know, learn what it's like to go from 50 employees to 500. And like, what an opportunity missed in terms of gaining those skills. And I might not ever be in another position where I would have the opportunity to learn those skills. If you're doing it because you genuinely love it and you can be financially motivated, you can be driven, but if you're doing it because you love the game and you enjoy it every single day, you're going to be a lot happier. And the fact that you're happy while you're doing it is going to allow you to be a lot more successful. That's a mic drop right there, man. How can people find you? Um, at Top Dog Law on all platforms. Um, if you are an aspiring entrepreneur, I would encourage rather than uh, DMing because we get a lot of business inquiries and stuff in the DMs, just send me an email. It's just james.helm at topdoglaw.com. I love meeting new people and helping new people uh, as much as I can. Growth House is a very much a, a go-giver community. We want to support, especially the people that provide so much value like yourself. Come speak at our events. You're on podcasts. We appreciate you. Heck yeah. How can we provide value if someone does reach out? Because the last thing I want someone to reach out, and I've talked about this a lot, don't ask, hey, can I pick your brain? We want to provide some kind of value to you as well. Mm. What kind of value can someone bring you right now? So one of the things we just launched our Phoenix office, relatively new Google My Business location. And so um, if you could watch some of our content on social media, get some of our legal advice, and then you would be kind enough to go to our Google page and leave a five-star review and just say, hey, you know, I checked out this person's social media accounts. It looks like they give free legal advice, but yeah, I would definitely contact if I was ever in an accident. Those Google reviews do help us get customers. So I'd appreciate that. I love that. And here's the thing. If someone reaches out to you with the email and says, hey, man, just had a, you know, I just watched your videos, did the Google review. How much more likely would you be like, oh, appreciate this person. Now I'm actually going to respond. Uh, Not someone that just said, hey, bro, I'll take you out to lunch. I'm also in Phoenix. I want to pick your brain. Yeah, 100%. And, and that's absolutely right. It's like, you know, for better or worse, I get a lot of people that reach out and want to get together. And it's like, if you can lead with some type of value, like saying, Hey, I took the time to listen to you talk for 50 minutes. And I took the time to like go on your website and leave you a review. Humans are reciprocal creatures, mm -hmm. right? Like if you do something for somebody, they are always going to want to reciprocate that value transaction. And so absolutely. And one more level to that. And here's three of my top takeaways from the podcast. Mm. And here's how I'm going to implement them or already implemented them. Bro. Come on. You Come go, on. you want to hit them back and be like, <laughs> I appreciate yeah. you, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So anyways, bro, this has been fun, man. Let's go. I was so excited. Like I literally live now 10 minutes from you. This Let's is amazing. Go. Dala, I appreciate you being yeah, a co-host. Th thanks for participating. <laughs> Jesse Ray, Growth House Podcast. We're out.